to the edge of the surgery table. You never know what's going to happen. When you're on live TV, you just got to go with it. Looking for a job is a lot, you talked about this a second ago, it's a lot different than looking for an internship. It's the most <laughs> unorthodox thing you're going to do because there's no science to it. It's like the amount of experience you can get by diversifying and using different internships can really lend well. I, I really want to take that opportunity to get to depth and, and get to know the people who live there. I was taking 20 credits to make sure I graduated on time, broadcasting WMUC, but I'm not going to turn down NBC, so I did all of that. but as well-rounded as you can present yourself, that's, that's the probably key. You shouldn't underestimate the value of being likable. Um, that, that's a, a, a big portion of um, why someone will like, pluck you out of a huge stack of resumes. And you have to be able to emote with the news that you're covering because you're dealing with an inherently socialized form of accepting what the news is and being able to access that social is super super important. You have to be flexible and open to change and when you're a journalist you have to be flexible and open to change too but never compromise who you are and your values. I know, I know that there's going to be some very strong opinions. back is that we are in a dynamic, really a changing media landscape is with a lot of change in the way that we consume media, the way that we produce media, interact with media, and even who is media, who's a journalist and whatnot, especially with all the current events that have been happening. So I know that all of the factors that I've just mentioned do affect your chances of getting a job or an internship in this economy. So we're going to be talking about all of that, especially with the panelists here, because I know, I know that there's going to be some very strong opinions. There's been a lot of stuff going on, and citizen journalism um, is the guy who writes a blog, or starts a blog a journalist, as somebody who news streams and events, um, a news event as a journalist. So why don't we riff on that a little bit? I'll start by saying that, um, first of all, you're all getting jobs since you came tonight. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but you should encourage your friends to go anyway. Um, I think that uh, the, as you introduced this question, um, yes, like the format changes, the platform changes, the time changes, but the um, core principles of journalism are the same um, as they were uh, decades ago. And, you know, in black and white television when there were just newspapers before that. Um, so what is journalism? I think journalism is telling a story in a, um, the highlights of a story in an important, accurate, and um, a timely way without compromising any one of those things that I just mentioned, not compromising the accuracy, not compromising the storytelling, and not compromising the swiftness in which it's um, being told. But that being said, um, of course, as you, it's been ingrained in your um, minds here at the school, um, not letting uh, the speed of which you need to break something get in the way of, of facts and figures. Um, in terms of when I went to Maryland, um, there it was right before you know Facebook and Twitter, and when everyone had an outlet on the internet. So. Um, you know, blogging, um, there's a huge debate about are bloggers journalists, and I think that um, there are formats in which a blogger is a journalist on like a <coughs> blog on a reputable news site or on a blog on a um, with, from a legitimate um, someone who's proven himself to be legitimate. Um, but stuff like uh, Snowden and, and WikiLeaks, I don't know if I would call that journalism so much as having a journalistic purpose, but it's definitely different than. Um, what I think is, and what I, I think is a common thought of what journalism is. So I don't think that even if you are online versus on the CBS Evening News or on the front page of the Washington Post, um, that the format changes, but the values of it don't. It's TV journalism. When TV started, TV wasn't considered journalism either. Um, so one of the things that you always have to be aware of is that 
things you have to be flexible and open to change and when you're a journalist you have to be flexible and open to change too but never compromise who you are and your values um, the values of journalism are always being fact-based and you know reporting the best and you know most fact-based accurate story you can anybody can be a journalist because I feel like things I'm also a socialist so you'll learn this about me as we go through this whole thing I'm I'm, I'm very much a socialist. And I believe that we've kind of like leveled the playing field insofar as people being able to report information. But there's a level of quality that's ultimately at importance right now. And that's where the crux of most of this conversation is going to be. It's in how do you stand apart in your ability to do what you do, the level of quality that puts you above the average person that tweets, I ate a Reuben sandwich today, or you know, just you know, or people that you know, like or citizen journalists or those kind of, you know, those kind of journalistic avenues. I mean, that's what it's all about. It's about quality. It's about accuracy, and it's about uh, being able to tell a story in a uh, cogent and uh, intriguing manner. Um, so, what's the big list, I guess, of the social media reporting now that people really want that immediacy? I think that. Um, we're, we're in an era where you can't um, operate around them. And so it's a pers the same as everything we're talking about is a personal responsibility. Um, I think that there is a, um, where the lapse is, is that people don't, journalists themselves, don't, um, aren't as serious before they hit like 140 characters to send, they don't take that as seriously as if you're writing a story for the front page of your paper or for the lead of your um, broadcast. So I think that that's the, um, the lapse. But um, I mean, just last, I cover politics, and um, you know, just last week, um, there were several reporters that I work with that um, tweeted and retweeted that a congressman had died. <laughs> congressman was gravely ill, but was not dead. Um, and that happens still. Um, so I think that, it, and these are good reporters. These are not um, uh, young um, and experienced, um, you know, cub reporters on the Hill. These are good journalists. So I think that that it's a, it's a, um, a, a could be a potential problem for anybody. And that's just, it's just the same exact um, uh, personal responsibility to your 140 character tweet as to anything that your name and your face and your credibility is is attached to. The show I produce is called The Stream, and The Stream is a um, community-based show, and so we really rely on our online community a lot to generate discussion, give us topics, um, and that means we're on Twitter looking for story ideas constantly. And we'll run into this every day where you know someone will tweet something out and it won't be anything, or someone will tweet something out and it turns into something huge. There's a lot of verification that goes into every single thing we read on Twitter because of these issues that we've all run into in the past. Um, and it's, you know, it's not even just in D.C. How many celebrities have died in the last year that haven't really died? You know, this happens all the time. And, you know, you kind of get to the point where you take everything you read online with a grain of salt. Um, but on the flip side of this is you do need to be careful some of the things you tweet out because people like me are reading them and then putting them online and making them, you know, news articles. So if you don't really mean that you hate that guy down the street who, you know, is playing his music at three in the morning, maybe don't send it out just because it lives online forever, even if you delete it. Whether or not they choose to respond is their choice, but if they're aware and smart that there's a story that is out there about them because well, everybody can see, you know, their app replies, if you add somebody, hey, are you still alive? <laughs> Literally, like, it would save you a uh, hundred years of, you know, controversy if you just do that. Like, it takes two seconds. And people don't do it, and it, it drives me insane when I see like music journals. The music, you know, things happen in music every second. I work in electronic dance music. You know, most of the, most of the news that I cover is twelve hours away. It's like, well, I, you could talk to the person. They're they're likely awake when you were asleep. <laughs> so you could you could do this before you go live the next day with a story that's completely wrong. And it it, it literally drives me crazy. It's absolutely insane. There's no there's no reason for it because there's full transparency. And that's an important thing people forget. And we know that as journalists, that we, there are plenty of things out there that aren't true. I think the majority of the people that are on Twitter and reading things don't know that. And they see these, t these tweets from credible news sources that they, that it could be an error, it could be, you know, a typo, it could be anything. And 
they take that as the news and what it, and it, and even if they retract that story, people there are some people who might not see the retraction. So it's just another reason where we know that that there's a lot of things where you need to do that verification and you need to make sure that you know there's is there another source that you can check. But some people don't care and they read that and they're like, oh, this that that's on the internet. That that's that's the truth. So you just want to remember that there are. Still, those people that don't realize that everything you don't read on the internet is isn't true. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that they, that Twitter is a, I guess, a dominant thing for you guys in terms of your places of work. But in terms of some of the other tools you use, like Facebook, maybe sort of like that type of thing, in your jobs, like what do you guys uh, use in terms of measuring your engagement to to the audience? We're on Google Plus, Tumblr. Um, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, and we're constantly engaging with people using all of those platforms. And then every day we have um, about two to four web features, they're called WebExes, Web Exclusive, that go out and they have you know a paragraph of text and the rest is a Storify. So Storify is something that news organizations are turning to even more than ever before to aggregate those conversations that people are having online. And all of that together is, you know, the way that I am working to change the face of journalism at my show. Um, so yeah, no, I'm, I use all that stuff constantly and, and it's, it's surprising how often you'll just, you know, I'll, be, I'll try to remember I have to post to Google Plus today or, you know, I need to be more engaged and it's hard, but remembering to do that is really important because you build up a following and a community of people that are, are going to be people you rely on later. As much different experience as you can get. Don't just do one internship and try not to do multiple internships doing the same thing because the more skills that you have, and this goes for the, in your classes, because things that I never thought I would use were just going, like things that I didn't concentrate on, I'm using more so than a lot of my skills I thought that I would use every day. So as much as you can, it's, it's cliche, but as well-rounded as you can present yourself, that's that's the probably key. Generally in your first job you're doing everything and you need to know how to do everything and if you don't know how to do something they don't they don't need to waste their time with you. Um, and so I, you know, I was very fortunate. The one thing that I did not do well and that I would implore you to do is I, I didn't ever make the connections or carry them over from internships into um, into future kind of contacts or you know employment opportunities and um, that evidenced by the fact that I haven't seen Christine since last year's convention. <laughs> um, but you know people want to help you. People aren't so networking is the yeah, key. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. crucial, and I and I know that because I made the mistake and I did it. And yeah, I, I turned out fine and. You know, my life is pretty awesome, but <laughs> I had really great people in my corner who helped make that possible. If you have a dream, ideal job you want in life, do it as an intern. Like, ideally, if you're like, I want to write for Pitchfork and write about Balkan bass music, then go ask Pitchfork for and write about Balkan bass music. And nine times out of ten, they're going to be like, well, that's absolutely insane. And we're not going to pay you. And the internet's a wide open territory. Go for it. That's the thing. Like people are willing to give people opportunities now. That's the one thing that's different about the journalism field. I feel with the internet being so prevalent is that you have a wide open realm of possibilities. And if you have a dream job and a dream idea, go out and attempt to do that, and find that space and expand that space. Open it up. See what it opens up into, and grow with that. Because ideally, you will grow into the dream job that you want out of that experience. Because you'll open up a door that you never expected to open up being in that moment. So that's the one thing I'll say. A lot for a lot of people it translates into their first job because if as an intern you make yourself so integral to the process, like I've literally, the I've um, my assistant producer now, this girl Jackie was my intern and she became so integral to my day-to-day -day work space that I had to offer her a job for me to be able to do my job the next day. <laughs> so um, I think becoming that integral is, is really key. The one thing that got me the furthest was every time I came into a new situation, I made a list of 10 people I wanted to meet. And in, in that circle of whatever I was doing. And then once I met those 10 people, it created a whole other list of 10 other people. 
and that thing expanded. And I still keep a list of 10 people. I can pull off my phone right now. And in every experience, it grows, it grows, it grows. And to that point about having that outlook, that's like ultimately important. That's like the most important thing you can do and like really take yourself to the next level with the maximum amount of effort and probably the most minimal, like the minimal amount of work. Does the number of internships that you do really matter? I don't think the number matters. I think it's what you can, when you go to a job interview, what you can say, you know, this is what I learned from this. This is where, from what I learned, what I want to further do. That's what a lot of job interviews that I went to, and I'm sure you guys can attest to this, that it wasn't so much what I did, it was kind of why I want to move forward. Or that was where I got the most interaction with them with future employers was why I want to keep doing this. Why now I did that, now why am I here to try to do this? I think that, that you don't have to have six internships. I think that kind of limits you in some sense. Yeah. You shouldn't underestimate the value of being likable. Um, that That's a, a, a big portion of um, why someone will let, pluck you out of a huge stack of resumes. Um, having some personality and um, in your interview process being someone that I could picture sitting next to and working with and trusting and talking to and spending how much time with. So I think likability is um, just a no-brainer and it's such a no-brainer that you don't think of it, um, but I think it plays into uh, getting a job on any field, but you know, especially in a, in a really competitive field. When I graduated, was I was not ready to be poor for a long time. It was going to be poor for a very long time, and you have to accept it now and move forward um, because because you will be. And no one tells you that. No. It's like a secret. Your hours are gonna sag. Your pay is gonna sag. You're gonna work every holiday. You're going to eat fast food that you've never heard of. You're going to go to parts crazy. of the country and like. You're gonna learn what a stakeout is, and that's when you like sit outside of someone's house for like 24 hours straight with a cameraman who's wearing the same clothes that he went to work in that morning and didn't expect you. Like, there's so many um, things that you have to love the end product and like be in it for the long haul in order to um, to, to really stick in it um, because your first job will suck. But then that being said, and this is actually um, a good uh, a quote. My first job was at NBC News, and I um, was a newsroom um, desk assistant. And my first boss was Tim Russert. Um, I was just incredibly lucky to work for Tim. And um, the first thing he said to me when he was giving me the specifics of the job, which were like you know the hours and and the pay, was um, that if nothing else, a career in journalism will afford you a front row seat to history. And no matter where you are working, whether you're working in Washington, D.C. and in politics, or if you are covering a music industry, or you are um, covering like a new wave of uh, Twitter and social media, it absolutely does. And you get um, to meet incredible people, both, you know, high profile, big names, and, you know, people, uh, some of the most compelling people I've met are in like the midst of like disaster in Haiti or after school shooting in the middle of nowhere. And, and, and not celebrities that I've met. Um, so I think that, that that's what makes all of the other things, like your horrible pay and working on Christmas and, uh, and Hanukkah and all of the other holidays, um, worthwhile is Stay that off. it all okay. even is. The other big thing is I felt like, and Katie can talk about this more, I, my first job was not in journalism. I took this job doing PR and marketing for this tiny security company so I could live with my my boyfriend and you know make our little life together and I was miserable I was so miserable but and I felt like I had let everyone down and my mentors from school can tell you I was afraid to let them know that I took that job because I was I was I felt like I had let people down but the best thing that I could have done for myself was take that job because the number one thing it did for me was cement the fact that this is the business that I need to be in. And that's something, do not be afraid to take a job. If you need a job, just take it. You can always leave. Um, and, and I think that Christine makes a good point. Your first job is probably going to suck. And thinking it's not going to suck is Naive. doing yourself a disservice. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, you know, there's always that person that you see that had this like really awesome career tra trajectory who like I'm gonna speak from broadcast experience because that's what I know um, who started in a big market and then went national really early and you know just that person is 
the exception of the exception of the exception? There is not one clear path um, to getting to be, if you do A, B, and C, then you become a TV news anchor, or you do this, this, and this, and then this happens. This is a field that is so dynamic, and things happen on such a fluke. And um, I used to work for Bob Schieber at CBS, and this just is a great um, explanation of, of that point. He literally, he is one of the you know most legendary TV journalists right now. Um, of our time, he's a fantastic journalist. He got his job um, at CBS News. He was a uh, reporter for the Fort um, Fort Star Telegram. He came to DC, wanted to visit CBS News, had not a connection there in the world. He goes up to the front desk, and it just so happened at the same exact time that he had walked up to the front desk, a man by the name of Bob had a meeting with the bureau chief of the Washington DC bureau. The receptionist mistaken Bob Schieffer for Bob Hager and took him into the DC bureau chief's office and Bob walked away with the job as a television correspondent and to this day like there was just an oversight on the little receptionist death. It's a story that you could never recreate but there are like you know hundreds of little anecdotes like that by you know anybody that you would meet and um, that's how people in news get their jobs or people who it's just an absolute fluke. Doing the right things, absolutely, and setting yourself up for that fluke, but it really is. Uh, there's the who, there's the what, there's the when, there's the how. The most important one in this generation is the why. And you have to be able to emote with the news that you're covering because you're dealing with an inherently socialized form of accepting what the news is. And being able to access that social is super, super important. So understanding the why and also creating an emotional connection to the stories that you're covering because that will give you the opportunity to be able to then create a deeper connection with the people that are accessing the stories that you're writing, that you're reporting about, that you're, you know, like, you know, creating that interplay with the people for. Um, 